and welcome into the hard count. It is Wednesday, March 27th, 2024. The last one on the face of the planet. And we got some comments out of Oxford, Mississippi from a, a former Florida Gator talking about his old team. Now, I don't think he was meaning to throw shade, but nonetheless, it's March. And so any movement on the college football front is going to generate some noise. So we got our thoughts on it. We'll talk about it here in just a matter of moments. Also, staying in the Sunshine State now, uh, Miami. I think they have a massive opportunity for them in 2024, not just in, in terms of what it could mean for this season and how many games they could win, because that's the obvious part, right? Everybody wants to win ball games, but I'm talking about when you look at the ripple effect of what this year could be for Mario Cristobal and company. I think this could be a tone setting year. We'll explain that in greater depth here in a minute. The unpopular takes, y'all have been just answering in full force to that prompt, talking about the unpopular takes that you strongly believe in. Today, we, we discussed a take from a, a certain individual that feels like Alabama may not have any drop-off at all in the Kalen DeBoer era. In fact, they think that Kalen DeBoer will keep Alabama as a top-five team consistently. What that's going to take and what would go into that, we'll talk about it here in just a matter of moments. Also, setting expectations for Nico Iamaliava. We defend the Rose Bowl. I mean, we, we got a lot to jump into here. It's March. And we're going to fill an hour-long show talking about college football and only college football. So we're glad to have you all here. Make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you're following me on the social channels at J.D. Pakel, Twitter and Instagram. Quick housekeeping note, there will not be a live show tomorrow, but there will be a show tomorrow. So if you're listening on podcast, don't worry about it. The operation is the same for you. If you're watching on YouTube, we will still have a show, 11 a.m. Eastern, Business as usual, but we won't have the live chat and answer that in the same exact way as we typically do because we will actually be taking our, uh, our operation out to Auburn, Alabama, sit down with Hugh Freeze and company and check out what's going on there during spring practice with the Auburn Tigers. So fired up to get out there. Again, make sure you're following on the socials to get all the behind-the-scenes stuff from our trip out there. Should be a lot of fun, but just wanted to make sure you all knew when you see that premiere at 11 a.m. Eastern, same thing is the same thing, but it's a... Uh, not live in living color. So we're going to make sure we err on the side of transparency there. All right, make, make sure you're, uh, you're dialed in here. And to keep you dialed in to what's going on on the hardwood, man, we understand now. The brackets, maybe it's busted, maybe it's not. Maybe you're flirting with not, not a perfect bracket because those don't exist right now, but maybe you're close to a perfect bracket. And if you want to make sure that you're tuned in to every single March Madness game, we got you covered. Prime Video is the place to be. So you need to sneak in those tournament games while at work, because I know you do. Prime Video has you covered. Watch every game live on your phone, on your laptop, or you can watch at home with a Prime Video subscription. Prime Video gives you choices to add on channels like Paramount Plus and Max, both featuring March Madness tournament games all in one place. It's March. It's Madness. Stream it all on Prime Video. Prime Video, man, I'm telling you, the place to get all of your March Madness needs met. Thanks for locking in with us. We appreciate them locking in with us as well. All right, let's keep a good thing going now. I posted this prompt on my Twitter page, at JD Pacal, and just asked you all this question. This is kind of the, the fun part of the year. We can ask questions like this because there's not games being played, so we can sort of take a broader overview of the landscape. Who is the most ruthless college football fan base on social media? You open Twitter, you open Instagram, and this fan base is just continuing to get after it. And I have a couple that I want to get into here. This is not an all-encompassing list, just so we're on the same page. But I think the, the, the far and away answer across the board was Tennessee. And it wasn't just like Tennessee fans were raising their hands and saying, yep, yeah, it's us, we're the most ruthless. It was like other fan bases that were nowhere near connected to Tennessee that had thoughts on this. You had... Uh, Florida State fans, you had Oklahoma fans. I mean, you had fans that weren't even relevant to Tennessee over the course of the last couple of years that were saying, yeah, that fan base, they will get after you. So here's my thing. If everyone's saying it, if it is like 99% of the population is responding to the same thing, we're going to go ahead and kind of take a hint there and go ahead and put Tennessee as one of the most ruthless fan bases when it comes to social media. Florida State, I think, has to be in this list as well. And if you need some sort of example or some sort of proof that they are as ruthless as they are, you just got to look at what happened after the college football playoff rankings dropped. Because I think we all agree on this, man. Like, even if you think Florida State shouldn't have been in the college football playoff, you looked at how that whole thing went down, and you're like, yeah, 
if I was a Florida State fan, I'd probably feel the exact same way. Yeah, that probably wasn't handled 100% how it should have been. And so Florida State fans heard that, saw what happened, and have been in attack mode really since that ranking came out. Like, it's one of those things where maybe another fan base would have said that's a bummer, one or two days pass, maybe a month passes, maybe two months pass. I mean, Florida State is still in go mode. Florida State is still on 10 when it comes to how they feel about that college football playoff rankings and uh, how they feel about individuals that did not side with them on those college football playoff rankings. So Florida State, man, they are flexing their muscle. They've made it very clear how they feel about this, and they have been the epitome of ruthless on social media. Yeah, their passion is, is, uh, is showing through. There's a lot of segments of fan bases that are in that, you know, more extreme 10%. You see that extreme 10% in Florida State, but I think you also see a, a pretty solid middle 50% that has made their voices heard using the social channels. Ohio State. Ohio State, the thing with them, man, they're just a massive fan base. Like, the thing with them is they literally have boots on the ground and ears everywhere. So if you're someone like me who sits behind a microphone and talks about college football – and gets to call it a job, which is hilarious in itself, if you say anything that is not pro-Ohio State, or maybe the Ohio State fan base doesn't really agree with, they will find it, and they will hunt you down, and they will get after you. It doesn't matter where you post it. You could do it on a message board, even if it's not an Ohio State message board. You could put it on Instagram. You could put it on, on YouTube, Twitter. Wherever you put it, Ohio State has ears everywhere. And so there was a point in time during last season where there was the whole science and stuff going on, and we felt a certain way about Michigan, and quite frankly how we thought the whole thing was a little bit overblown. The Ohio State faithful got after it. And, like, we were on the receiving end of that, but we understand it, man. It's a passionate ordeal. And so I, I actually have nothing but respect for the Ohio State fan base with how they responded to us in that form or fashion. Kind of feel like we have a good uh, – a good relationship with the Buckeye faithful as it stands right now. But nonetheless, Ohio State, ruthless, and we respect the heck out of it. Speaking of respecting ruthless, LSU, I think, is uh, a little bit unique in this sense because for LSU, the whole state of Louisiana and LSU culture as a whole sort of feels like its own foreign concept. And not that it's not specific to college football because it definitely is, but like we understand there's like a, a extra – extra layer of pride baked in to that LSU fan base with how they feel about their football team. And so if you say something anti-LSU or you're an opposing fan base or you come after LSU, period, they feel like you're attacking their family is what I've been able to, get, to gather after kind of trying to put this list together. Like, if you go after LSU, they will respond in the way that if you're attacking their brother, sister, family, like whatever it is, they're coming after you and they're not afraid to make a personal and again, it's one of those things where, like, I'd probably feel the exact same way if I was in that fan base. Like, that circle is tight. Those folks love their Tigers, and they will defend them on every single platform, and they will defend them in every single manner, whether it be the comment section, whether it be the direct messages. Like, they will get after you. So, again, not an all-encompassing list. Probably more you could have included there. But the, the ruthless part of this whole thing almost sounds like a negative connotation. For me, I don't think it is. Like, I think it's just passion shining through on social media. And yes, there's some things that can cross the line, and I'm not endorsing that, but I am saying the overall volume from these specific fan bases on the social media side of things, I respect, and I think it's what makes college football unique to every other sport. So those are our most ruthless fan bases when it comes to the college football social media landscape. Curious to hear what you all think about that, though. Curious to hear if you all have any other, uh, any other thoughts on that. So it's March and in the month of March, spring football kind of gets started. We get to hear from uh, more players and get to kind of hear more of these guys at a microphone and over the you know, course of spring football. We'll hear from more of them. But Princely Uman Mielin took to the mic, I believe it was yesterday, and gave some uh, interesting comments about his former team in the Florida Gators. Now, to give you context, Princely Uman Mielin was at Florida for a long time. Prince Lee Emmanuel has since transferred to Ole Miss. He's a super talented edge and will contribute in a big way for Ole Miss this year. But uh, here's what he had to say after spring practice at Ole Miss. My uh, attacking the run game a little. For things like that, you know, I feel like at Florida, like the way I was coached, it was kind of like 
it was almost as if like they was just telling me to go out there and use my talent, if that makes sense. But here, you know, Coach Lou and Coach, um, damn, oh, Coach Lou and Coach Joyner, they really on me about the little things, you know, attacking the run. Coach Lou really goes through the progressions of the drops and the routes that are being run when I have to go into coverage. Like when I was at Florida, it was like they would just tell me, go drop to this area and I would have to figure out everything else on my own. But here, you know, they go real into depth. I feel like I'm actually getting, you know, developed here. So I don't think Princely Uman Mielin is just putting Florida in the crosshairs and went to the mic and was like, all right, I'm about to get after these dudes. Like, I'm, I'm about to just make sure I make a story out of my press conference with my former team. I don't think that was the approach there. I think he tried to prop up his current coaching staff and try to, you know, say some positive things that he genuinely felt about the people coaching him now and say how that was a positive transition for him. But whenever, you know, you kind of try and raise something up, that – that backhand, man, is pesky. So the backhand kind of hit Florida in an unfortunate circumstance, in an unfortunate way. And this is also kind of compounded by the fact that this is now the second instance in the last month or so of somebody having something negative to say about Florida and Billy Napier. And the key thing here, it's not just that they feel a certain way about Florida or it's their opinion. Like, they have an issue from an organizational standpoint from people that have been pretty close to the organization. Steve Spurrier talking about how he wishes things were a little bit more tidy organizationally with, with Billy Napier and the way that they have put together their staff and things like that. With how many support staff members they had, he had some things to say about that. Now here's Prince Lee Uman Mielin saying he's getting better coaching and better development while he's at Ole Miss. So again, we're kind of adding into the fear if you're a Florida fan of like, hey, what's going on behind closed doors? Because you see what happens on the field, but then when you hear people talk about what's happening behind the scenes, whether it be the staff, whether it be development, whatever it is, and you hear them say something negative about that, that starts to set off the alarm and you kind of start to fill in the blanks in your head and you're like, well, okay, is this staff just not have it together? We just have guys that don't know what they're doing. We got guys leaving our school, going to another SEC school and saying the coaching is better. Like, what is going on here? Again, Prince Lee Emanuel Ellen, I don't think he was trying to get after Florida. And is this unfortunate? If you're a Florida fan, if you're the folks in Gainesville today, yeah, is it a bad look of sorts? Yeah, I think you could probably have that be a fair statement, that it's not necessarily great optically. But like anything, we need to provide context. Context is just crucial for any conversation on this show, but especially right here, because when you talk about coaching, I think it's, as much about the coach as it is about the player. Like, I'll just say this from when I played football, some of my best coaches that I got along with and that I think I played the best for, they did a great job not overcoaching something. Like, there is such a thing as providing too much detail and too much oversight and being overbearing with how you coach things. Now, Prince Lee Uman Mielin is saying, when I went to Florida, they kind of just let me play ball and allowed me to rely on my talent a little bit more. And he's saying to Ole Miss, they're giving him a little bit more of a tutor, tutelage of uh, doing things more of a detail-oriented fashion, which is great, like, like great for Prince Lee Man Mielin. But the same player may respond differently to that kind of coaching at Ole Miss that he does at Florida. And so what I'm trying to say here is what you do as a player and as in the way that you're coached, it's very much so predicated on how you respond to that coaching. Also, it's worth noting here, these are different schemes between Florida and Ole Miss. Like, just to call a spade a spade here, like, Ole Miss's defense is different than Florida's defense. What Florida asked Prince Lee Uman Mielin to do might be a little bit less technical than what Ole Miss is going to ask him to do. It's also like Prince Lee Uman Mielin was also very productive at Florida. He had seven sacks last year. So say what you want about coaching and development. Like, he was also still a, a very solid player for Florida a season ago. So I understand now this is going to set some alarms off for people. This is going to frustrate some people and kind of cause them to question the organization again. And here's my whole thing on this. Like, is this making noise if we're playing football games on Saturdays? Probably not. Is it having the same effect if people don't have this label over Florida and this roster that they're a 5-7 and seven team and that Billy Napier's got issues? Again, probably not. This whole thing is being amplified because of the time of year, and because of how people view Florida right now. So it's unfortunate, but like when you look at what Florida is right now in the offseason, there's nothing that Billy Napier can take the mic and respond to Prince Lee Emanuel Ellen or any other player respond to Prince Lee Emanuel Ellen that's going to change the narrative or change the optics around this whole thing. What I think needs to happen here is games need to start being played. 
Because you know what would kind of change the narrative around Florida? You know what would really cause everyone to just forget Prince Liam and Miellen and Steve Spurrier saying things? As if they beat Miami week one in the swamp. That would change the entire view of Florida. That would be what really turns the tide here. And to go a step further, if someone else comes out here in the next couple of weeks and says something negative about Florida, doesn't matter, right? Like the, the, the folks at Florida are like, okay, we get it. People feel a certain way about us. We've had people be close to this organization and have negative things to say. It is what it is. Let's get to playing football games. Let's, I mean, like, c- come back and talk to us after we beat Texas A&M. Come talk to us if we're undefeated going into that game against Georgia. Like, that's really, I think, what they're hoping can happen here in the near future. So, overall, I think we're, we're very overreactionary beings. Just as humans, it's in our nature. We see something, we immediately digest it and give our take right away on it. We don't like to have things baked. We don't like to provide context. There's some nuance here. I don't think Prince Liam Mielen is trying to throw shade at his former coach and, and that old staff. Like, he's just trying to prop up Ole Miss and say good things about where he's at currently. Good for Prince Liam Mielen. Unfortunate how it all sort of shook out. But again, I don't think he's trying to get after Florida. And for Florida, again, it's unfortunate. But at the end of the day, it's still going to be about playing ball games. And I think the context of how Prince Lee Uman Mielen responds to Ole Miss's coaching should not directly be a reflection on how you feel about that staff out there in Gainesville. So it's March. We got press conferences. We got folks saying things. And with that, we got, uh, we got headlines being made, unfortunately, unfortunately for us. Appreciate everybody dialed in live. You could subscribe to the channel, like the video. That would be tremendous and would obviously help the overall program here. Staying in the Sunshine State, man, I mentioned Miami. They play Florida to start the year. That one's going to be fun. It's going to be in the swamp. Place will be rocking. When you talk about Miami in 2024, man, I cannot help but feel like Mario Cristobal and that entire organization have just a massive, massive opportunity in front of them. We'll talk about that right now. As I just mentioned, make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you've liked the video. Make sure you're following all those socials, at J.D. Pakel, Twitter, Instagram. We appreciate y'all so much in advance for doing that for us, man. Like, hey, it's, it's a year-round ordeal here on this show. It's a year-round operation. It's college football, period. We don't take a break from it. You don't take a break from it because you're an absolute college football junkie, and we appreciate you for that. Uh, get your fix right here, year-round. College football, the way that you want it. So as I mentioned, massive, massive opportunity for Miami in 2024. And the immediate future, like, that, there's the obvious things to say here, that you can win a lot of ball games in 2024. Like, that's the most obvious part of what this opportunity is. You got a quarterback who you feel pretty confident in. You, pr- you feel pretty confident in him running the offense that you probably wanted to run last year. The, you know, obvious part of that is you didn't really have um, a consistent product at quarterback, whether it be Tyler Van Dyke or any number of guys that jumped in there for him. Jakari Brown wasn't the guy. Like, there, were, there was a lot of things there that left something to be desired at quarterback. Now, at the most important position on your football team, from an ability standpoint, you have upgraded. And that's not just me saying that. Like, you go and check out the reports over there at Kane Sport, which is the Miami on three site. You check the, the message boards and get the intel over there. They'll tell you, like, hey, the, the presence of Cam Ward in that facility, it just, it's different. It just feels different. And some of that, I know you have to, and we did a spring propaganda segment yesterday and talking about how you got to kind of be weary of thoughts around a quarterback. And I understand that. I think that's still fair to be cautious before you see it. But there's no other way around it. Like, Cam Ward's played a lot of football, had a lot of success. He is going to be an upgrade for you at quarterback. I don't think that's a stretch. So you upgrade at quarterback from a team that turned the ball over about as much as anybody else in the country last year and that, quite frankly, should have been 8-4 and four if you take a knee. You upgrade at quarterback from a team that should have gone 8-4. and four. Like, how good are you with a, with a solid product at quarterback? I think it's a fair question to ask. Your roster and talent level when Mario Cristobal got there wasn't where it needed to be. Wasn't to the standard for the folks in Coral Gables. Wasn't up to Mario Cristobal standard. That took some time to kind of get that together. Now, is it a finished product? I think they're going to keep building. I think they're going to keep on stacking great recruiting classes. But the overall point is, I think you're now in range to be competitive for the conference title. And that's sort of the next thing I want to say here, man. Like, the ACC, we say it a lot on the show, it feels really wide open to me. And I, I look across the board here, like the consistent players in that conference, Clemson, pretty much year in and year out, you got to worry about them, right? I mean, they're kind of on a downward trend. I don't feel nervous about Clemson if I'm, a, if I'm a Miami fan the same way I have been in the past. Florida State, 
They lost a lot. Yes, they're the defending champions, and they're the team in the state that you've got to go try and beat, but, like, Jordan Travis isn't there anymore. Keon Coleman's not there anymore. They are 83rd in the country in returning production. There's only 134 teams now, so 83rd returning production. There's a lot of new faces. They're going to be asked to step up in Tallahassee. Okay? Louisville played for the conference last year, played for the conference title. They got over 20 new transfers, one of them at quarterback. Like, you see where I'm going with this? There's so many new pieces for Miami, or, or across the ACC to where if I'm Miami, I feel like my peak in year three is meeting where a lot of these other programs that would typically be contenders are a big question mark. Not saying they won't still be contenders in their own right, but there's a lot of question marks across that conference. And then to kind of sprinkle this on top of it, like, I don't know what Florida is either. Florida, their over-under win total right now is five and a half. It feels like there's a lot of opportunity for Miami to be successful this upcoming year. What I just mentioned, too, with year three in that culture, man, I think they're now in a place where year one, you set the standard. Year two, you kind of push your entire roster to that standard. Year three, your team should own that standard. Now, should is the key word there. It, will they do it? We're about to find out here. But I think this is the year where you can really start to expect your team to operate like a Mario Cristobal coach team, which for me, given his track record with the way that he's won at different places, should be exciting. Okay, that should be exciting. Now, that's the immediate future. That's 2024. It'll be a fun story. Like, great, let's live it up. Awesome. How about the macro level? How about what it's going to mean long term? Because college football now, we've seen this. I mean, since the sport's been in existence, it is a ripple effect kind of sport. And what I mean by that is what you do on any given year, <coughs> excuse me, um, what you do on any given year will impact the next couple of years, right? Because of how you acquire talent, how your team is able to build off of what they did from year to year, the, the continuity, the consistency on your staff, all those things. Like optics are so massive in college football. In Miami, the way they've acquired talent, just so we're on the same page, has been phenomenal. Mario Cristobal has gotten after on the recruiting trail. Since he's been there, the two years he's been there, two top 10 classes. That'll do. Now, two top 10 classes under the product of a five and seven year and a seven and five year. Y'all, what happens when Miami starts winning? What happens when they go and win 10 ball games this year? What happens when they win the ACC? Or what happens when they make the college football playoff? Like, at that point, Miami's not just a brand they're not just selling this story of this is how we're trending come play at the U like you don't have to sell what you used to be anymore at that point in time you're selling what you are right now and I can't stress this enough that is dangerous that is dangerous for the rest of college football because in the state of Florida it is so vicious when it comes to recruiting because you have the in-state schools of Florida, you have the in-state schools of Florida State, UCF now a power conference, and then you got Georgia and Alabama trying to get in there. Like, everyone wants to recruit Florida. But I promise you, there's a lot of individuals that would love to stay in-state and play at a power in the state. Florida State, I think, is starting to reap some of that rewards that they have uh, been able to generate some buzz from their, their success the last couple of years. It wouldn't surprise me if Miami is able to really be a powder keg there and acquire a lot of that top talent. 10% of the top 50 players right now in 2025 reside in the Sunshine State. And again, Miami, they're, they're in that top 10 range. They're recruiting at a high level. There's no way around that. But I'm saying if you start winning, they might be in that top three conversation. That might be the extra juice they need to snag a guy from a, a Big Ten school or an SEC school or flip a commit. Like That might be that extra juice they need to land those other top-tier players to push them over the hump. So 2024 would be the year where you set the optics and you say, okay, yes, the last couple of years were what they were. They were a building process. Yes, before Mario Cristobal got here, Miami has not been at the standard that we expect it to be at. But now, this is a new Miami. You got a guy that's from here, that played here, that understands what it is when it's humming, and he's running the show now. Look at what we just did last year. That's the start. Don't you want to come be a part of this? That side of things getting rolling at a, another level than they already at right now, scary for the rest of college football. Very, very scary for the rest of college football. So both on an immediate future level and a macro level, Miami has got some major opportunity in 2024. I can't wait to see it. Cannot wait to see it. Let's keep a good thing going here. Hey, big news today, man. Nick Brake back in the studio. 
fresh off vacation from Disney World. Excited to get you all a chance to see him again as he has been away for the last week or so. He'll be taking your questions, be taking your, uh, your takes as a whole right here in the live chat. So get after it right now. First come, first serve. Make sure you submit those right now, and we will make sure we get to those here in a matter of moments. All right? Appreciate you all that are dialed in live. One of the many benefits of being tuned in to the live show on YouTube. Podcast, we love y'all. Rate, review, all that good stuff. We appreciate y'all for that. But if you're tuned into the YouTube live show, that's how we really get to have this communal feel and uh, kind of have it be a, a college football sanctuary, a safe haven of sorts for us during this part of the year. All right, let's keep on rolling here. <coughs> quick cough, quick cough. Got to get that checked out, man. Got to get this cough figured out, Nick. Can't be coughing on air anymore, brother. You know what I'm saying? It's a bad deal. It's a bad deal. All right. Now, speaking of, uh, of deals, how about a good deal? We got an unpopular take that Alabama will improve under Kalen DeBoer and be a consistent top five team. Now, to reset this whole prompt for you, I put on my Twitter page, at JD Pakel. Get at me on there. What is your most unpopular college football take that you strongly believe in? All right, now this take, again, that Alabama will improve under Kalen DeBoer and consistently be a top five team. Now, that... That word improve is a little bit hard for me to get behind because look at Alabama and look what Nick Saban has done there. Like it's, I don't know if you're improving Alabama. I think you keep Alabama as that standard in college football or keep, or keep them in that top tier. Like That would be a massive success. This is from, our, this is from uh, our friend Dylan who brought this unpopular take to the table. All right, so again, hard to improve on the Saban era. I think that would be a little bit of a difficult task. But to me, keeping them as a top five team with this massive transition of going from the greatest of all time as your head coach to a new individual in that head coaching seat, be very impressive. It'd be very impressive. So what would it take for them? On the long range of things, it would mean they have to recruit at a top three level. Okay, so if, they, if they're in that top five year in and year out consistently, Kalen DeBoer has cracked the recruiting code. Because Alabama, as good as they've been and as well coached as they've been and as many good players as they've had, Yes, they develop. Yes, they're tremendous on the scheme point of things. But I cannot stress enough, like, Alabama has been Bama because they've acquired the best players at the high school level. Yes, they use the portal. There's no way around that. But the high school level has been the bread and butter for Alabama. And that was our question when Kalen DeBoer got the job. I don't question if he can coach ball. 104-12 and 12 as a head coach. You don't just luck into a record like that as a head coach, okay? So he can coach football, but can he compete on the recruiting trail with a Brian Kelly, with a Kirby Smart, with a Lane Kiffin? Like, those kind of play, those kind of guys that are elite at acquiring talent, Lane Kiffin obviously a little bit more so in the transfer portal side of things, that's going to be massive. That's going to be the key differentiator for them when it comes to being consistently in that top five year in and year out. A subplot within that is how they recruit the quarterback position. Now, granted, if you're recruiting at a top three level, you probably are adding a, a big-time quarterback or two get any given class. But, like, Kalen DeBoer and his offense is such a quarterback-centric system, which we'll talk more about here in just a matter of moments. But you look at what he's done as a head coach, and I know Ryan Grubb called his offense, and he's now with the Seahawks. It's still a Kalen DeBoer offense. Let's not get it twisted. With the way that he operates offensively, they throw the ball. Over the course of the last four years, they have averaged north of 40 pass attempts a game. Translation, we need someone here that is going to spin the rock for us to run the system that we want to run. Now, on top of that, if they're successful for the course of the next however many years and they're consistently in the top five, it means that defense was able to kind of ramp it up a little bit from previous Kalen DeBoer defenses. Now, let's make sure we're on the same page here. Kalen DeBoer as much as he is held responsible for what that defense does, he's not coaching the defense. Like, same thing with Lincoln Riley is probably true about Kalen DeBoer. However you feel about the defense, you should feel about how he has hired his defensive staff. Like, Kalen DeBoer is not out there coaching up how to tackle and things like that. So you're responsible, but I think even more so you're responsible for who you hire to oversee the defense. Kane Womack going to be the guy for the Alabama. The key number that we talk about here on this show to win the SEC, history tells us, you got to be in that 22 points a game or less allowed. 22 points a game or less. 22 points a game is what 2019 LSU allowed per a game. That was, I think, the highest margin over the course of the last five years. Most teams that win the conference are somewhere in the range of 
19, 18 points a game allowed. So you got to be elite on defense. It's the price of admission. You want to score a lot for sure. And Kalen DeBoer is an offensive mind. There's no way around it. But you got to make sure that you turn the water off when you get into that conference. And there's going to be some offenses they have to play over the course of their time in the SEC. I say their time in the SEC. I'm talking about the new entries with Texas and Oklahoma. Like, you're going to have to beat those teams, whether it be in the regular season in the future or whether it be in the college football playoff. Ole Miss, like Tennessee, there's, there's a lot of offensive juggernauts in this conference that are going to make you have to, have to be able to turn off the water. There's no way around it. So if this happens this season, if Kalen DeBoer hits the ground running, they're a top five team, that would, I think, be kind of the way that you're able to promote this longevity that we're talking about here with Dylan. Because, I mean, with the way that they could be a team that's consistently in the top five, I think there's a way where they, you know, go 9-3 and three this year and they, and they find their way to climb back and everyone sort of recalibrates their expectation around Kalen DeBoer and he gets some time to make it, you know, his kind of Alabama. And that's great and that's one way to do it. But if they're successful this year, if they're able to have success this year and be a top five team, that would change the game around Alabama. Because we said it a lot when he first got the job and they were, you know, looking to retool the staff and the way that they were, you know, trying to keep things going on the recruiting trail. This season for Alabama is going to be how recruits define Kalen DeBoer's Alabama, if that makes sense. Because Nick Saban has always been the face of the Crimson Tide. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, what are they going to be now that he's not there? What, are they still going to be dominant defensively? Are they still going to be one of those teams that competes for hardware every single year? Like, what are they going to be now with Nick Saban not running the show? That's the ultimate question here. So if they're able to have success this year, you do a lot of damage control. Damage control is the wrong word. I think you alleviate a lot of nerves that people could potentially have around Alabama on the recruiting trail. Right? They're, they're kind of in wait-and-see mode around Alabama, and if you go out and win the SEC in year one, or you get to Atlanta in year one, people say, okay, they're going to be just fine. Okay, Bama's still Bama in a lot of people's minds optically. And so when you look at this upcoming season, on one hand you say if they get it done, yes, Nick Saban didn't leave that cupboard bare for them. Yes, you know, there's still a lot of big-time players, even though the transfer portal did what it does when, you know, Guys end up transferring out. Like, that's, that's the reality that we all live with now in modern college football. You lost some players. But still, man, like, everybody on that roster that committed out of high school to Alabama was a part of a top three class or better. So there's good talent on the roster. But on the other hand, let's be very clear about this. Kalen DeBoer and his success in 2024 for Alabama will be a different formula than what these guys signed up to play for. Like, Kalen DeBoer is not working with his own ingredients here. And there's probably no better example than that than Jalen Milrow and him playing quarterback this upcoming season. Because I'm a big Jalen Milrow fan. I think he's the right guy for Alabama. But his system that he ran last year and that he was successful in last year is very different than the system that Kalen DeBoer ran all the way to a national title appearance with Michael Penix Jr. We said it previously. 40 attempts a game is what Kalen DeBoer has historically done. Jalen Milrow is not a 40 attempts a game kind of quarterback. He threw 23 attempts a game last year, and he was phenomenal with his legs. Like, that's his MO. And so what I want to make sure we say, if they're successful this year, and Kalen DeBoer adapts his personnel, or adapts his style to his personnel, rather, and they have success with it, I think that would be incredible for the overall optics around Alabama. Because at that point, you say, okay, Kalen DeBoer isn't this guy that has to have exactly the right ingredients. Like he's got to you know, have every, everything in place. It's like he's winning with players that weren't necessarily guys he recruited. He's winning with someone else's pieces. Imagine what he does when he gets his guys. Imagine what he does when he recruits top-tier talent to fit his system. And at that point in time, I think that's the juice you would need to really get things rolling on the recruiting trail and keep things rolling how you want them to out there in Tuscaloosa. So will Bama avoid a drop-off long-term? I think this year is a massive tone setter for that. Not just because it's important to win ball games every single year with that Alabama logo. It's important because that's going to set the tone for acquiring talent in the future, which, of course, is kind of the name of the game right now in college football. So great unpopular take. Again, get at me on Twitter and Instagram, at J.D. Pickell, and let me know your unpopular takes in college football that you strongly believe in. We appreciate you for that. We appreciate you for that. So there's, there's a lot. Speaking of takes, man, there's a lot of takes right now around Nico Iamaliava. Like, 
I see a lot of uh, different answers under that tweet that say, Tennessee's going to win the national championship. Tennessee's going to make the playoff. Nico's going to win the Heisman. And I think that's in some way like answering the prompt of what is your most unpopular take that you strongly believe in. So we appreciate that. But it also sort of got the wheels turning a little bit for me of what should be the proper expectations when we evaluate Nico Iamaliava in his first year at Tennessee as the guy, right? Because he was on the, on the roster last year. I was a redshirt guy, and I thought that was phenomenal for him to get to learn the ropes from someone who was as experienced as Joe Milton. When you come to Nico, man, like the pressure for him is nothing short of ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And that's not to say that he can't achieve all the pressure or can't, you know, achieve all the uh, expectations that are on him. But, like, guys, the number one player in the class of 2023, anything it feels like for me, short of winning the Heisman Trophy and leading Tennessee to a college football playoff berth and, heck, maybe winning the SEC on the way to doing that, I think a lot of Tennessee fans maybe would feel a little bit underwhelmed. And I'm not saying that that's the end-all, be-all for Nico and they're putting that kind of pressure on him. But the fact that's even a conversation around him, I think tells you a lot about the pressure that's on his shoulders right now and the, the expectations that are surrounding him right now. I think the better way to describe that is people are seeing Nico Iamaliava in Knoxville as the guy who can kind of be that equalizer for them to allow them to pass the Alabamas as they're kind of in this transition mode, to get them on that level of a Georgia, to make them a national title contender. Because the roster, they haven't recruited as well as those schools. But when you got the quarterback in the class of 2023, the best one out there, like there's obviously some reason for a, a lot of excitement, a lot of expectations. So while the pressure is ridiculous, the hype is very understandable. Like it does not take an NFL scout to turn on Nico Iamaliava's game tape and say, yeah, dude's special. Dude's very special. Like you watch him play. There's no physical limitations to his game. He can run it. You saw that in the bowl game. He can spray the ball around the yard. That's pretty obvious when you watch the ball pop out of his hand. And you also were able to win his recruitment over schools like an Alabama, like a Georgia. Just rule of thumb for anybody out there, if Alabama wants your players, if Georgia wants your players, Kirby Smart and Nick Saban are spending their time recruiting those players, that's probably a good sign. Those guys are pretty good talent evaluators when it comes to uh, what the recruiting world has become. And also on top of that, the offense in 2022 was elite. Like if you're Tennessee, you've seen what that offense can be with the right guy pulling the trigger. Joe Milton, we've said a lot on this show. I think he was probably better than maybe some folks would like to admit from last year. Completed 65% of his passes, threw for over 2,800 yards, didn't throw a lot of picks, only five. Like he was, he was serviceable last year. And the offense scored 32 points a game. So say what you want about Joe Milton – Probably not what you would have hoped for as a Tennessee fan coming off of that 2022 ride with Hendon Hooker. But Nico and what he brings to the table, man, he can physically bring more than what a Joe Milton brought in some respects. I think people think he's going to be a little bit more accurate. We'll talk more about that in a second. The bowl game really sort of started to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the bowl game really is what catapulted, I think, more of this hype too. Because before it was just like the, hey, have you seen his high school film? Hey, Nico was rated here. Hey, Nico's this, Nico's that. And then you saw him on the field, and you're like, all right, we're winning the national title. Like that, that was kind of the narrative out of that bull game against Iowa. Because Iowa's a great defense. And Nico, quite frankly, tore him up on the ground. Did fine throwing the football. And he's going to be a guy, I think, for you in this upcoming season that has earned a lot of that excitement. So you look at the schedule. You play NC State in Charlotte. You play Kent State. You're at Oklahoma to open the year. I want to make sure we say this. Let's allow for some progress for Nico with the way that we evaluate him going forward. Like, let's, let's understand that those first couple of games, what he is in those games, what he is at Oklahoma, he might be a different quarterback then than he is at Georgia November 16th. Like, he's a guy that's still figuring out how to actually be a college quarterback. Yes, you got a whole year doing it, but you can't account for how valuable game experience is. And... Thankfully for Nico, he's about to get a whole lot of that. But I'm just making sure we say this. You saw the bowl game. He was awesome. Let's make sure that we understand he's still a developing product. He's still getting to be what his best is going to be. And so my hope here is that we allow for some context, which I think is massive for any conversation in college football. But let's allow for some context as we set expectations for Nico. Like if Nico goes out there and throws the interception in game one, 
and doesn't have the kind of success that you would hope he would have in game one. Let's be slow to press the panic button because so much of this Tennessee offense, I believe, as football is just period, so much of it is dependent on your teammates answering the call to action as well. Like if Nico struggles, let's, let's understand that there's a lot too on what is his running game doing. Because the running game is what sets up the pass game for, for Tennessee. What are his receivers doing? Do you have guys that are winning consistently on the outside? Joe Milton, I think, kind of got a raw deal in this sense. Now, Joe Milton, was he, was he the solution in all of those situations where things weren't perfect? No, he wasn't like the eraser of sorts. But still, Squirrel White was really the only receiver that I saw last year for Tennessee be a true threat against defenses. Brew McCoy got hurt, and that's horrible. You hate that for Tennessee, but I'm just saying if he stays healthy, maybe Joe Milton has better numbers. Maybe Tennessee looks a little bit sharper offensively at different points during the year. So again, if Nico doesn't have the success you want him to have, understand that he's a, you know, a first-year starting quarterback and that this offense is built on other pieces also winning their matchups and also doing their job. So Joe Milton last year, we talked about it, 20 touchdowns, five picks, 2,800 yards, and 65% of his passes completed. Also ran for seven touchdowns. If Nico Iamaliava has that stat line, I'd be very excited. I'd be very excited because that means that's probably the base for him, the jumping off point for what his career is going to be in Knoxville. But I would also say I think he's going to have a better stat line than that. I think he'll be somewhere north of 65% in terms of his completion percentage. And that's the key thing I want to say here. You compare Joe Milton's stats last year to what Hennon Hooker's stats were when he had that magical ride in 2022 and he didn't get to play the full season, which you hate for him. But like the key differentiator between Joe Milton and Hendon Hooker, for me, was completion percentage. Hendon Hooker was like 69% on his passes. That is why they were so successful. That is why the offense hummed the way that it did. And so as freakishly gifted as Nico Iamaliava is physically, as much as he brings running the football, as much as he can do throwing the ball downfield for you, the key thing for him is consistency. Can you consistently hit those passes that are somewhere between 15 yards and 10 yards, and be on the money and be on time. Because if you can, that's when this thing hums. At that point, that's when defenses are going to have to, you know, honor that sort of pass game. And then the run game gets rolling. And those safeties creep down. And the deep plays get going. Then Nico starts throwing deep shots. And then you also have the RPO game open up. So all of this Tennessee offense is dependent upon each other. There's layers to it. And so if he can be consistent and have stability with what's, asked of him that's going to be a game changer for Tennessee and at that point we talked about 32 points a game for Tennessee last year I wouldn't be shocked in the slightest if Nico is consistent throwing the football Tennessee averaging somewhere in the range of 36 37 points a game now that's lofty that is sort of some things breaking your way there's no way around it but if that happens how many games is Tennessee winning nine ten so I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to set expectations for Nico Iamaliava, but at the same time, the talent is obvious, the physical giftings are obvious, and what he's going to be long-term in Knoxville is and should be extremely exciting. So the big thing for him, consistency, make your layups, be able to hit those intermediate passes, and go from there. You love to see it. Love to see it for Nico, and I'm excited for that whole thing to get rolling, man. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch because the kid is, kid is special. It is very, very special. Hopefully now, we told you we're going to Auburn here tomorrow, which will be a blast. Cannot wait to get out there. Cannot wait to show you all some of the behind-the-scenes stuff we get to do out there. Hopefully we get out to Knoxville, Tennessee as well. Another reason to be subscribed. Another reason to be following on the social channels at J.D. Pacal. All right, get into the live chat. We'll have a good time here. Just a matter of moments. Well, it's always a good time on this show. Uh, shout out Owl City. Who else sings that song with Owl City? It's always a good time. All right, one more thing to get to here before we get to your questions. We had a, one more unpopular take sent our way. And so you answered the prompt. There's no shade being thrown here. We just got to answer how we feel in relation to this take. Robert says uh, his unpopular take in the college football landscape that he strongly believes in is that the Rose Bowl is okay for the first 10 seconds you're there. He says after that it sucks. He says the commute and how old it is, dot, dot, dot. So if you've watched the show, you know that we have uh, nothing but massive respect for the Rose Bowl. 
massive respect. Now, to be to be clear, like there is a little bit of uh, nostalgia baked into this for us. Like I grew up in Southern California for the first part of my life, so I've been to the Rose Bowl a couple of times. Was fortunate to go there for a Rose Bowl, the game itself, and then also got to see uh, Auburn and Florida State play there for a national title game. So I've, I've been able to experience the Rose Bowl firsthand. So yes, I, I have a have a certain way I feel about this. Let's start with this. Uh, talking about the, the Rose Bowl being old. I understand that. I understand the desire for a little bit more, you know, renovations and, and some more modern feel within a stadium. But like, here's my thing, man. College football as a whole thrives on the history of the game. It thrives on tradition. It thrives on the things that have stood the test of time. Talking about touchdown Jesus in Notre Dame. Talking about the traditions that, you know, college football has always thrived on. Dotting the I for Ohio. Like, college football is special because what we're experiencing right now, in a lot of ways, there's that common thread that your great-grandparents also got to experience. They were fans of this team. You're a fan of that team. You saw the exact same thing. If you're an Ohio State fan, you and your great-granddad appreciate the dotting the I in the script Ohio. Same thing with the Rose Bowl. How old it is for me, it's not a, a negative. I think in, any, in another way, it's a positive. It's a college football cathedral. Some of the biggest games have been played there over the course of the sports history. The Rose Bowl, as a venue, it's not about how it looks, though that's kind of cool too. I appreciate the, the cool, like, cursive Rose Bowl with the actual rose on the front of the stadium. I think that's awesome. But it's about the pageantry, and it's about what you get to experience watching that game, being in that place. That's, again, a lot of history baked in there. So, the, yeah, it's old, for sure. No way around it. But saying that's a, a negative, I would disagree. I think that's a positive. Also, everything in college football right now is being revamped. Transfer portal, NIL, the calendar. And I'm not even saying those are bad things. I'm just saying there's a lot of things about college football right now. Heck, the kickoff, who knows where we are with that in a couple of years. There's a lot of things in college football that are looking different next year or in the next couple of years than what we've known the sport to be. The college football playoff, like there's so much about this game that is changing. Can't we just enjoy the stuff that's not changing? Can't we just lean into the stuff that's made the sport great for so long? And yes, I'm on my soapbox here a little bit, but I don't apologize for it. College football is tremendous because of those traditions, because of those venues, because of those things that have stood the test of time. And so with all these things changing, we should be defending the Rose Bowl like a national park. We should be defending South Bend, Indiana. We should be defending all these places that have made the sport what it is, in my humble opinion. So I understand that. I, I, get, I get where you're coming from. Last thing I'll say here, you cannot duplicate in any other venue, wherever you are. doesn't matter what it is. doesn't matter what pro team plays there. doesn't matter you know, what, what stadium it is. You cannot duplicate. The sunset at halftime off the mountains. There's nothing like it. It's unique to college football. It's like an oil painting before your very eyes. And that in itself, I think, is a reason why I love the Rose Bowl. It's another reason why it differentiates itself from any other venue in not just college sports, but sports, period. So the Rose Bowl, for me, is everything that is good and right about college football. I understand the thought that it's far for some people, but like, Y'all, we're playing, we're playing national title games in major cities like Los Angeles, and I think we're, we're all over the map here. When Santa Clara, like the Rose Bowl, where actually college football games are played on a year-round basis, having, having that be a venue that's consistent and honored, I'm okay with that. I think that probably passes the, uh, the smell test for yours truly, and I think for most college football fans as well. But regardless, man, we, hey, we appreciate the unpopular take. I did not mean to just take aim there at your take. But we, we had, to, uh, had to make our thoughts known on the topic itself. All right. Hey, back, back from vacation. First team, teacups. First team, it's a small world after all. I don't know the other rides. But we're going to talk about it here in a second. You know them. You love them. Producer of the Hard Count, Nick Brake. Back in the saddle, baby. What's going on, Nick? How we feeling? What's up, buddy? Good to see you. Good to see you, man. Talk to the people about vacation. We, we saw you in the live chat getting active a little bit yesterday. Yeah. Disneyland, Disney World. The folks weren't sure. There were two hats on the table for where you're going to commit to. Where'd well, you go? Well, my buddy Trey asked me or said that when he was made in the chat, someone asked if I had died. I'm still alive. You're still alive, um, which is I was great. in Disney World in Orlando. 
Um, I wasn't sure because my in-laws, are f- who I went with, are from California, so mm. I didn't know. Maybe we're going to Disneyland. I didn't ask. I don't yeah. know why. No, that's uh, great. You're the team player. You were yeah, down to go wherever. True. Well, Ferris asked me, hey, Nick, what's the most underrated ride in Disney World? Yes. And which one did you actually go to? Um, I don't know which one's the most underrated, but the most overrated is the Rise of the Resistance, which is a Star Wars ride. Okay. Because it does not do Star Wars <laughs> justice, which is my equivalent to college football for you, J.D., is Star Wars. So Yeah, I love, uh, I love Star Wars, too. Yeah, I, yeah that's true. Okay, yeah, but... Uh, I love that. Okay, I'll say good that. deal. That's what I'll say. Best ride, really quick, before we get to the questions, best ride, what was it? Hall of Presidents. It's not a ride, it's a show, but it's goaded. Hall of Presidents. The okay. Hall of Presidents. The Hall of Presidents. I'm a nerd. I look, I like what I like, you know? Dude, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm <laughs> with it. I love the, I, uh, I'm all about it. There were some cool rides. I liked it. It was fun. It's my first time I have ever gone, so I guess that's something that if you've got a chance to go do, go do. So Going back it. or no? Is, there, is it on the revisit list? I don't think so. Okay. All right. Daisy yeah. says, what? The Rise of Resistance is awesome. <laughs> Everyone says that. And my uh, brother-in-law, who's a little younger than me, he's 14, he was like, dude, you're just going to blow your mind. And I wasn't. Dang. I wasn't blown away. But Man. I respect okay. everyone who likes it. Um, also, by the way, the Rose Bowl has hosted a World Cup final, too. So okay. that adds another decorated thing to an otherwise amazing It's so good even thing. soccer wants to come play. Yeah, even soccer. <laughs> they even want to exactly. have a game there. Uh, Ferris says, Darth Vader and a Michigan Wolverine on the scoreboard before every game. That's cool. I didn't know that. That is um, cool. But anyway, we'll, I'll digress. The Truth asked one of the coolest questions. Um, uh, I've, I can recall. It says, J.D., why do a lot of once-proud programs fall so hard? Is it because they're full of themselves? Entitled? What do you think? That's a really good question. To me, I think the thing that doesn't get enough credit in college football is the way that programs do things and what I mean by that is Georgia I believe was successful over the course of the last three to four years yes because they have talent yes because they got one of the best coaches in the game but there is a standard there that is upheld with extreme intentionality from the outside looking in at least like when you go and play at a school like Georgia and you're surrounded by by big five stars and everyone there is you know pretty much the the best football player in their area for as long as they've been breathing that can you know potentially lend itself to some complacency or thinking that you are you know above a certain standard or above a certain way of doing things and that to, from again from where I'm sitting that has never existed at Georgia in large part because of that staff in large part because of Kirby Smart and then also because of how you nurture that within your locker room because coaches can set a standard coaches can say nice things and put it on a t-shirt and put it on a you know, uh, a wall during conditioning, whatever, right on the wall, whatever. But to actually have it mean something and to actually have that be upheld by the, the leaders in your locker room, I think that's really what leads to sustained success. And so what happens is those leaders in your locker room, they empower and promote other leaders within the locker room because they see the way that a Cedric Van Pran did it or a Brock Bowers did it or a Stetson Bennett did it. And they say, okay, that's, that's how it's done. That's, if we want to keep winning, we got to do it that way. Sign me up. I'm going to take on that role once that guy graduates, or I'm going to make sure that standard doesn't dip. So I use Georgia there as an example, as you know, consistency. But it's it's hard to do in college football where guys leave after you know sometimes one year with the transfer portal, but especially now where you know there's so much mobility and so much movement, keeping that standard intact and that culture intact. Uh, talent is massive. You can't get in the door without talent, but the culture of it all, I think, is really what allows teams to thrive and, and have sustained success. Yep. Okay. Uh, Javier says, J.D., between the Big Ten and the SEC, which conference has the most to gain from adding Florida State and Clemson should they leave the ACC, or which would have the most to lose by the other conference acquiring them? I think, I think the Big Ten would like to have Florida State on paper. And Josh Newberg has really um, illuminated me to this whole thought as to why the Florida State to the Big Ten would make sense. Like, I think – I think the SEC, or I think Florida likes being the team in the SEC. And so if you're the Big Ten, they've sort of been this national conference now since adding USC and UCLA. Like, that's kind of been their brand of we got you covered out to the West Coast. We got you covered if you want to watch Ohio State. Like, we, we are this massive conference that represents all of America. Well, you take that thing even further south, and you grab Florida State out of Tallahassee and the Sunshine State. Like, having that demographic and that audience, I think that would be – the way they would like to live. And so I think, I think that whole national footprint would be massive for the Big Ten. 
obviously for the SEC, adding a brand like Florida State would be huge too, but I think it would probably mean a little bit more to the Big Ten. Okay, I would agree. Uh, Briley uh, says, <laughs> J.D. Golly. Yeah, you feel good, man? I'm good, I dude. I, like, I don't know why I'm coughing yeah. so much here. I know, man. It's, we're gonna get it a, sounds hey, we're, like we're it good. hurts, too. And I feel bad for you. That doesn't, that's that's kind of no fun. We, uh, we, we got time. We got time until we, uh, we hit the season, so we're yeah. good. Yeah, that's we'll true. Ready this is off season, ball. yeah. Uh, Briley says, which coach would have a better season? Mario Cristobal, 9-3 and three at Miami, or Billy Napier, 7-5? and five. I'd have to say Billy Napier. Dude, that, especially the way that it looks, if they go 7-5, and five, and I say the optics behind it. We talked about it a little bit this morning with Andy Staples on his show. Florida could go 6-6 six and six and be a top 30 team in the country. Like, their, their last five games is against five college football playoff I think caliber teams. If Florida goes six and six or seven and five, like they really need to consider, you know, turning turning down the noise on the on the external side of things, and just understanding like how brutal that gauntlet is for Billy Napier and company. So I think seven and five would be the, the way that I would lean there. Now, if you go nine and three and you're Mario Cristobal, that's a success too. But given where Florida's at right now, given the way that people are talking about them, seven and five with that schedule would be phenomenal. Did he have three more questions? I uh, love it. Let's do lined it. up. This I love one it. Let's is do it. under the same vein. Sandman twenty three, our resident Longhorn fan, says, "Does Florida get the upset win over Miami in Week One?" See, that's a tricky one, man. That's a tricky one. I'm very curious to see what that line is when it, when it comes out because I think right now we're all assuming okay, Miami probably be favored. I said it on a, a message board the other day. I think it was at a, over at Kane Sport. I re- no, Miami on three site. I really just feel like if it was at a neutral site, I'd probably put the line at Miami minus four and a half, minus three and a half. But the fact that it's played in the swamp, that just throws a total variable into the whole thing of like, who the heck knows what's going to happen? Especially if it's a night game in the swamp, and that's your quarterback who has never taken a snap for you just yet in Cam Ward, and that's the first game experience he gets is against that Florida defense, against that in- entire crowd, and they're playing, won't back down at the start of the fourth quarter. Like, that's a, that's a whole other ball game. We've seen a lot of teams that are of a superior caliber sitting here right now in March, we think a superior caliber, than a Miami, and uh, really struggle in the swamp. Like, remember the first game of the Billy Napier era where Utah came to town, I think it was two years ago, and AR went off, and we're talking about Florida maybe being a college football playoff team, and that year kind of went how it went. Like, Utah was a really good football team. They played for a Rose Bowl that year. They won the conference that year in the Pac-12. Rest in peace, Pac-12. I'm just saying, weird things happen in the Swamp. Tough place to play. Yep. We're going to find out. We're, yep. we're, we're going to find out. Uh, when I say we're going to find out who wins, we're also going to – I'm glad we don't have to pick this game today because I do not know where I would go with that one. Do yeah. not know where I would go with that one in the slightest. Absolutely. Fun. J.D., that, that – uh, discussion about Miami that you had earlier in the show. Boy, did it spark some debates. Uh, really? Well, that's been the thing know, today. What was the uh, – I didn't get to see it in real time. Well, was there? yeah. <laughs> there was a comment from Dezu that I think uh, that summed up one side of it. It was uh, how SMU has been – you know, they have as many titles in the, fl- in the ACC as Whoa. Miami. Uh, Hollywood, okay. I think – I don't want to ever say somebody's a fan of someone they don't like, but I think – going to bat for Cristobal, uh, saying they've got a Rose Bowl, or he's got a Rose Bowl yeah. win. So, you know, he's not a bad coach. No, so it, it's, it's It was a good argument. I always like watching people go I to war. I love that. Good Thank deal. You. Good uh, deal with the chat, showing yeah. some juice, even in March. Yep. Even in March. Yep, so Miami won the chat war today. There it is. Uh, by being the most relevant team in the live chat. Oh, yeah, OG, OG Gary. Right there. Uh, OG Gary, uh, it's good to see your name pop up again. I haven't seen OG Gary for a while uh, I've since I've been gone. Friend. Say the top four is Ole Miss. In quotes, gross. Uh, USC, Texas Tech, and Clemson. What went wrong and what happened in college football for that to happen? That's a great question. I, I mean, I think the the first thought there is, okay, you got Ole Miss. I'm trying to make sure I have this list right. He says he's got Ole Miss, you mean to Texas read it again? Tech. Yeah, you might, USC. Yeah, let me pull it up again. Uh, the OG Gary says Texas Tech, Clemson, Ole Miss, and USC are the top four. Jolly. It means anarchy happened, and I'm assuming he means top four by those are the teams that would get a bye in the college football playoff. 
Ole Miss won the SEC, so I don't think anything really went wrong for Ole Miss to win the SEC. It just means that Ole Miss was exactly who we think they could be at this point in time in the year. Potent offense, improved defense. Texas Tech, and we've, we've kind of been drinking the Kool-Aid here with Texas Tech. Yep. I've been drinking the Kool-Aid. It means that Joey McGuire and his elite eval process translated. It means the Big 12 was a question mark, as we all thought. Probably means that Kansas State underperformed, Utah underperformed, if you want to talk about things going wrong for them. USC, the defense got figured out, man. Miller Moss was Heisman Miller from the Holiday Bowl, and the defense got figured out. Probably means that Ohio State didn't hit how they wanted to on Ohio State. Probably also means that Oregon and uh, what they were offensively wasn't necessarily where it needed to be in, in crucial games. I'd still be surprised if Oregon and Ohio State aren't college football playoff teams, for the record. But who am I missing here? There's one more team. Clemson? Clemson. That's the funny one. That's a like, tricky that one, man. Probably, ha I guess, happen. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 funny because they're kind of the forgotten yep. child in this whole thing because we're talking about Florida State and we're talking about Miami. Like, Abbo Sweeney and co. Cade Klubnick, if he figures it out a little bit. I don't know. I'm just saying I, I don't think there's uh, something that went wrong so much as I think Clemson probably figured it out and got it together offensively. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I uh, love JD, it. uh Get to this last question here. Um, it. It's by the truth. It says, with the new NCAA coming out soon, what defense do you want to run? 3-4, 4-3, 3-5, or 3-3-5, three, three, excuse yeah. me, and then the 4-2-5. You know, in the old game, I was a big 4-3 uh, guy because <laughs> you could, you could uh, really get a good push up front with those four down linemen. Game's changing, Nick. You know, the game's changing. I might go 3-3-5. Three, three, I might put some more speed on the field with our yeah. five DBs and have our three linebackers running around back there and, you know, have some, uh, have some rush edges in the ground, like, or with their hand on the ground. I don't know. Probably go 3-3-5. Three, three, it depends on how the game plays, though, too. You yeah. Know? I would love to know how everyone else plays defense on that game. I just use, a, like, an edge rusher and try to sack the quarterback. Yeah, that's play. a good one. And then I don't switch on to the corner whenever they're throwing to him or else you get okay. in a lot of trouble. Dude, I, for a minute, I would go uh, – gosh, what coverage was it? I think I was playing something like uh, – oh, it was a zone blitz. And it would be where the safety had a blitz responsibility. And so I would line up with the safety and just kind of be a rover. Oh, that's and, cool. And, like, try and key on, like – because, you know, everybody has tendencies. Everyone's running, like, the four verts with someone running over the middle or they're running, you know. Like, people kind of have their tendencies. And so yeah. that safety was kind of like my equalizer. If I had someone with a good safety, yeah. hey, we're, we're not far. We're not – I see OG Gary cover two every time. <laughs> cover two. There it is. OG Gary. That's uh, good stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I, defense is – I was always so bad at it on that game. But I'll tell you, man, I could kick a 55-yard field goal in that game. I don't did know about you? 55 yards? Now, to be fair, I did up the kicker stats a little bit beforehand, but 55 on that game's not easy. That's still, not easy at all. Still got to be I perfect. I love it. You're like, juicing the bat a little time. bit, baby. Yeah. I love oh, yeah. that. Oh, I had to. That's I really absolutely love that. That's yeah, good that, stuff. That'll do it, I guess, JD. Good deal, man. Well, hey, Nick, uh, same time tomorrow, but we will be premiering. So don't freak out when you see it premiering. Yeah. We'll still be same time. We just won't do the live chat segment the same way that we would. But if you're on podcast. Same deal as always for y'all. Yeah, and we'll have a, technically we'll have a live chat as it premieres. I'll be in there hanging out, uh, so we'll we'll have some fun that way. But Phenomenal. it won't be very interactive in the other regard. But still, come hang out. It'll Perfect. Be fun. Yeah, a lot. I mean, good show tomorrow. Impact freshman we're talking about uh, a never too early peak at Georgia Clemson tomorrow. So should be a good time. Come hang Big out 12. with Nick Break in the live chat. Uh, Big Twelve projection rankings. I forgot. Yep, that's fun. Yeah, that'll be a good time tomorrow. So. Come in here, hang out. We'll have a real good time. Yep. And, uh, yeah, should be good stuff. Hey, Nick, glad you're back, brother. Oh, yeah. It's glad good to back. be back. The Ferris, chat missed you. <laughs> I missed you, obviously, but the chat also missed you. Ferris says, what's your recording IRL? Uh, I don't know what that means, man. Maybe I should, but. What does he say? What's your recording IRL? Like. What's your recording in real life? Yeah. What does that mean? I don't know either. I think IRL, like a way, website, I don't know what that means, Ferris. You are far smarter than I. There we go. JD, I'll see you next time. Good stuff. Appreciate you, big Nick. Back in the saddle back at it like we never left hey we appreciate y'all being dialed in appreciate y'all still getting in the live chat still watching the show still being a part of this even in the month of march okay college football is a special thing and we appreciate y'all celebrating with us uh celebrating it with us we, we don't overlook that we're extremely grateful for that and 
We're going to make sure that we continue to provide the content that you want to see here. So make sure you're subscribed. The fact this is a job is absolutely hilarious. I feel like we need to have a longer discussion about that sometime. But we are extremely, extremely thankful to get to do this for a job and make a living as a result. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all. We're going to keep this party rolling. And we will see y'all next time.